Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And third time's a charm. We've actually got a guest with us today. It's just we had all the gremlins arrived yesterday in force. And two shows didn't happen, although I ended up doing one of my improvised Ask Me Anything shows, which, which went very well. So uh, great to see you all here. Um, just my always start with a reminder, if you are new to the channel, please don't forget to subscribe. Please don't forget to consider becoming a patron. And thank you to the seven or eight new patrons who joined me since yesterday. Felt well done. I'm very, very pleased. Thank you very much. So we're going back to one of the things we did kind of in the early days, which is sort of one of those Normandy live battlefield uh, shows, except we're not quite live. The footage we're using is footage I took three or four weeks ago out for our guest because the problem with doing stuff absolutely live is you depend on the weather and the signal and cameras failing and hot and traffic and things like that so I've, we've got the footage in the can as the pros say so what will happen during today's show is i'll put up the footage of the bits and pieces our guest is talking about so we are talking about events that were happening 78 years ago these last couple of weeks of july a uh, lot we've been talking about cobra we talked about Leslie McNair uh, uh, earlier in the week. That was a bit later in July. We're now talking about the area south and slightly to the east of Caen, the ridges that ran down uh, along the area there that were depended by the first SS Panzer Corps. And my guest was on earlier, way in kind of in the early days of World War II TV. Things were a bit clunky, talking about sort of the supplies, logistics, and never army, a never ending army of supply. And Arthur Glaxon is back today to talk about. He's, in fact, two books on this subject. The volume one is out and volume two is on its way. So I'm going to bring Arthur in right now. Um, so good evening, Arthur, or good afternoon. Where you are. How are you today? Oh, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for having me on. So as we said last time, you know, you've done a few things. You've been a captain in the Canadian Army. You're, you're assistant professor of military history at the Canadian uh, Royal Military College. And you've, you're now kind of an accomplished author. That first time I spoke to you were kind of at the beginning of that journey. And now you're, you're a bit further along. So, so, so tell us what's been happening since you were last on the show. Oh, I, um, I received some research money to write this book on uh, Operation Goodwood and Operation Atlantic and made a successful um, uh, book proposal to, to Mrs. Ruth Shepard, uh, the editor at Casemate, and uh, they agreed to publish this book, Bloody Barriers, and I talked them into doing two volumes of it. One, covering Goodwood, the huge British armored attack, and uh, Operation Atlantic, the Canadian supporting uh, attack for Goodwood, and the second one, um, coming out in either December or January, uh, Bloody Barriers Volume 2, which will cover from the 23rd of July onwards to the 5th of July, uh, covering the, the more intense uh, Canadian attacks of, of uh, Operation Spring and some of the subsequent combat in Tilly La Campagne. So, uh, and thank you for that. So the thing is, when we get into Goodwood, particularly Goodwood, not so much Atlantic and Spring, but Goodwood has been endlessly discussed by historians over the nearly eight decades since it happened and it's still debated is it a german victory is it a british victory is it a draw is it a this is it that the people debate the figures they debate the uh the the leadership decisions they debate who said what about what but actually i think as part of those endless discussions what has been lost a little bit is actually good, solid descriptions of the battles on the ground. It's all become a little bit of a discussion about the aims and the leadership. And so diving into these subjects again, you know, you've provided lots of new new evidence, you know, your 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 footnotes and end, and appendices and, and uh, uh, all the sources are listed over numerous pages in your book. So you've gone to these to these archives. So how. Before we bring up the first map, how difficult was it to kind of go back to beginning and start and look at these operations fresh? Oh, it was um, from the German side, it's very, very difficult because the, the first SS Panzer Division's war diary, as well as the first SS Panzer Corps, is destroyed at the end of the war. And so, well, the, the war diary of Panzer Group West survived and provides a very good overview. Um, the absolute, the, the micro detail and that's what I've tried to establish in this book, is somewhat missing. Um, and, of course, many of the Germans were killed during the war or died most, uh, subsequently afterwards. Um, they never gave verbal accounts. Well, some did, but, you know, there's big gaps. And I've tried to use Canadian and British records to fill in those ultra-micro details in order to describe the battle. And the whole book only runs from the 18th of July up until the 22nd of July. So... 
I can use this as an opportunity to, to examine the, the armored doctrine of the British Army, the ability of the British Army, the British Second Army in this case, to, to fight a major armored battle, armored assault in the in the you know in the year 1944, and exactly how the Germans viewed the area south of Caen and its strategic importance to them, and what what they what Rommel before his wounding and evacuation from the front <clears throat> saw as almost potentially a second El Alamein, except this time now he had the resources to affect a very strong defense, a defense in depth that could take anything thrown at it. Of course, Rommel doesn't understand these, the RAF and the United States Army Air Force and how they're real, you know, deployed to fly in and blast the Germans to smithereens. Well, so I'm, I'm, you've just to key me up now, I'm all excited to get going. So we've, we've got both the video footage I've, I took, folks, and we've got maps as well. We'll bring the maps up now. And um, it'll be a bit clunky, this, because I've got to try and react to what Arthur's saying and pull up the right video at the right time, and we'll be pausing bits and pieces. Because of the complication of what I've got to do at my end, folks, we will kind of do questions at the end, I think, today, because otherwise I'll have too many things. And don't forget, folks, I don't have production managers doing all this stuff for me. I'm hosting and bringing up all the stuff as well. So we'll bring the maps up. I'll move as Arthur talks, and I think we're in for a treat with this. So there's a situation as it was sort of middle of July in 1944. So you've, you've partly introduced the fact of these two ridges there, but kind of run through what we can see on the map there and the situation as it was from the German point of view. Yes, the Germans, after the successful conclusion of Operation Charnwood, <clears throat> with the Brits clearing out the northern and the Canadians clearing out the northern part of Caen, still have this Orne River, which separates the Germans from the, uh, the large mass of, of, of the British Second Army. And moving west to east, we have these, these, I guess, one, two, three, four main strategic tactical features. Hill 113, Hill 112, which is the second SS Panzer Corps is engaged in heavy, extremely heavy combat with the British. And then to the south, they still have some uh, perfect kink tank country just south of Caen. But just beyond it, there's the kidney-shaped Verrier's Ridge. And to the right of it, not the right to the east, is Borgibus Ridge. And in front of these ridges, there's a series of little farms and villages uh, that are made up of uh, stone buildings. And the British, there's an, obviously a problem with launching a major attack here. They just have the airborne bridgehead, the bridgehead to the, the northeast of Khan, which to launch their attack from. And as everyone knows, I'm sure all the viewers watching understand, the British Armoured Brigade has a huge amount of vehicles. A British Armoured Battle Group, roughly 140 vehicles. And on uh, the, the close examination of the map, first they wanted to put an Armoured Brigade to tack first down what the area they called the Armoured Corridor, just to the east of Gibberville, and to the west of Trufferville and Emmyville. But they discover we can only do one battle group at a time. Of course, three armored regiments, three battle groups. And I say battle groups because they really are battle groups. Self-propelled artillery, some uh, forward artillery observation officers, the entire armored regiment, and motorized infantry and half-tracks, all done up as per British Armored Royal Armored Corps doctrine at the time. And it's just not the 11th British Armored Division, but it's the Guards Armored Division and the 7th Armored Division. They're all stacked up, and they take such a huge amount of time. The traffic jam goes right over the uh, the western bank of the Orne in behind Caen, and they're all waiting, despite the British Royal Engineers establishing these, these series of bridges in order to transport this armored mass forward, forward in what will become arguably the greatest armored battle, the biggest armored battle ever fought by the British Army. But there's a terrible problem. Just like at Herod's department store, you have the revolving door at the front. And say you're approaching Herod's with eight or nine of your friends, these, in this case, nine armored regiments, you can only go one or two in at a time. And so the ability to, to impose maximum force instantaneously is not there. They have to get them through that revolving door 
of those, those, those bridges and get into the airborne bridgehead and get past everything and get away from the traffic jams, the huge traffic jams and some other obstacles such as raised railway lines in order to deploy massive force. So just like Leonidas in the, you know, the movie 300, you know, they can take a small amount of Greek soldiers and potentially hold back the horde. In this case, the horde being the mass of the, this, this, you know, it's, it's the British Eighth Corps, but it's actually an armored corps. Of, of, you know, this, this massive, and they have uh, two supporting attacks, British, British uh, First Corps on the, the, the left flank, on the right flank, the British Canadian Second Corps, to which will attack and support, you know, the, um, the British, um, <clears throat> the right flank of the British Armored Assault, and of course, take care of any opportunities and completely clear and liberate the southern part of Khan all at the same, the same time. But there's a problem. The second, Arthur, yep. I, I like your analogy there because I think when I've taken people to the area of Goodwood, on first glance, it seems like good tank country because when I when I put up a bit of video in a minute, you know, it's open fields, it's lots of vision, it's lots of um, movement. But there are these choke points. I was out with Richard Fisher, who just republished an a book about a cannonade officer who was attacked as a, to the Middlesex Regiment as a machine gun officer. And there's a little, a little choke point in the village. It's so small, it's not even on the map. I can't remember its name, but it's in that area down towards Gibberville, where a, a crater from the pre bombardment uh, had just landed in a, a, a beginning of a village in a row behind with stone walls either side. And it delayed an advance down that road for hours because it was a choke point. And when you get choke points, be they mined uh, streets, craters in streets, or as you said there, underpasses and bridges or crossing rivers, Choke points, you don't need to look very far back in history to realize they are just the big, the big, big problem. Lafayette Bridge going back to um, you know, Sterling Bridge back in the so so um let's before you continue, let's give an idea of the of, the, of an overview of the terrain. So I can either pull up the video, Arthur, of the area northeast of Canny, or I could do one from the Bourgibus Ridge. Which one would you like me to do? Just give a, a basic idea for those who've never been to this part of area the world, what it looks like. Northeast of Cagney, so you can imagine the vanguard of the British 29th Armored Brigade charging through the fields. And, and of course, you know, you have these villages, these strong points made of the, the stone buildings that have been there for hundreds of years. But there's the hedges and the, the tree lines and the raised railway points. That wasn't the one I was going to do. It was this one. And by the way, folks, if every one of these videos I start with, it starts with an enlargement of one of Arthur's maps. And then there's a little red arrow saying where I am when I was filming. This is what I wanted to do. So uh, that was my fault, Arthur. As I said, folks, I knew I'd get these things wrong. So we'll start again. So that's where I am for this point of filming. Yes, and there's the, the, the little uh, the map there on the, uh, the memorial shows the advance of the British and how they, they charge through, of course, the absolute best of the best as far as fire support in the way of aerial attack completely stupefied and dazed the, uh, the, the members of the three battalions of the, the Luftwaffe, uh, 16th Luftwaffe Feld Division that were defending the very front lines almost in a cannon fodder manner. And the British simply charged through in between them through the smoke and the haze of this huge bomber strike with literally hundreds of four engine bombers, medium bombers, every artillery piece in the British second army virtually or <laughs> very close to it, firing away and blasting at all possible targets. And so we have uh, Brigadier Roscoe Harvey, the extremely hard charging uh, commander of the British 29th Armored Brigade, arguably one of the British, the best British armored commanders of the war. And he's charging hell bent for leather through the fields with his uh, lead three RTR, uh, third Royal Tank Regiment under uh, Lieutenant Colonel Silvertop pushing forward with his entire battle group. And of course, he's followed by the second uh, Fife and 4-4 Yarramunri. Yarramunri, I also have trouble with that word. Um, under, um, who commands that one? 
Well, while you're just saying that, don't forget, folks, we had Peter Hart on recently talking about the men of the Fife and Four Fire Yeomanry. So if you want to get an understanding of what it was like to be in uh, a crew of one of the Shermans in there, Peter Hart's book, Burning Steel, is a great accompaniment to Arthur's book. And you can sit there with multiple books across your desk and read back and forth and get multiple visions of this battle there. But while, I, while you're just getting your notes down, I'll hold it on that image there. This is what we're talking about for most of today's show, folks. Most of it is just gently undulating rolling fields with wheat or corn in them. Of course, one of the things about this part of the world is corn has increased massively in size since the war. The villages that were just a few houses around the crossroads have now increased in size. So there are certain locations that, although Arthur would have loved me to film at, they're just impossible to film at because there's an industrial park sitting there or there's a massive great car showroom. So we've done the best we can to illustrate the battlefield, but it is a battlefield that you cannot visit completely authentically because of the the increase in size but that's what we're talking about open wheat fields and i'll hand it back to you arthur yes uh colonel lieutenant colonel scott he's the one of the second four four uh second uh, fife and four four yeomanry uh, so as the uh the three rtr pushes forward they push off to the, to the left to the west and the second fife and four four yeomanry get out of their you know, the, the, the tail end of the three RTR and push forward on their own. So you have, eventually, they, they catch up a little bit. So you have two armored regiments and armored battle groups pushing side by side simultaneously. And they cross over the road, Convimont. And then uh, after that, the the, 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 the railway line, Convimont. And there's a previous railway line from, from Con all the way to Tron. They pushed over that as well. But... In this, in this way, they've been slowed down as they go through these choke points. And they had a barrage, a uh, Royal Artillery barrage, that they intended to follow. But despite their best efforts, they've lost it due to, due to the massive traffic jam and the sheer number of vehicles. It's a sea of British vehicles. You, you know, can't swing, you know, I won't say you can't swing a dead cat, but you can't swing, a, you know, you can't, um, you know, without hitting a British tank or a M3 half-track or a sexton self-propelled gun, and they're all pushing forward. And this is initially through the very dazed remnants of the, the, the 16th Luftwaffe Feld Division. And you're saying, oh, wait, what about the, the German armored counterattack forces that are supposed to, to rush forward to, to stop them with this perfect plan of the, the 86th Army Corps to, to counterattack with this Tiger Tank Battalion, the Schier, uh, Panzer Abtilung 503 and Panzer Regiment 22 with all its Panzer Force. Well, the, um, the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Force have bombed the assembly areas of both of those two smithereens. And though two companies have survived intact out of the Tiger Battalion, there's a sea of craters, a sea of craters everywhere that badly impair their ability to react quickly. And of course, every Br every German uh, telephone line, every German um, field telephone, every German radio is all pushed out of whack by the, the massive concussion blast of these explosions and the uh, the, the Royal Artillery bombardments. So the, the, the Panzers are very slow to react and they have to get their act together and try to get a few vehicles serviceable, um, which is a very small number of Panzer Regiment 22's Panzer Force. And... Um, the, the entire third company of the, the Sphere Panzer Abtilung um, 503 has been completely annihilated. Uh, but they can get a, a small number of Tigers going, some of them being the first Tiger IIs to see action in Northwest Europe, the first Tiger IIs to possibly you know, see combat in, in France. And these will be encountered by you know later in the afternoon by the Guards Armored Division. And you see there, despite these hedges um, that you know, uh, areas of tremendous combat, uh, but um, there's there's wide open areas. And of course it's dry, it's July, it's very hot. There's no tanks getting stuck in the mud. There's no major rivers to cross other than the Orne to, you know, get into action, but uh, it's perfect going. But the sheer number of vehicles and the sheer amount of force, it's not like in the middle of uh, the Ukraine or Russia, where the Russians can attack over a, a frontage of, say, you know, 20 or 30 kilometers with huge numbers of tanks, that, but they have enough room to go wherever they want. It's, it's a choke point where this armored corridor is actually 
uh, very much a, um, uh, it concentrates the British and German forces and almost forces them upon each other. There's no maneuver. There's no evasiveness. Well, there's a little bit of that, but, you know, there's, there's, there's no escaping these German tanks or anti-tank guns when the British finally do encounter them. And Arthur, just a question, because when I was there filming, you know, when you've got a bit of dust moving around, when you've got a bit of a heat haze, it would have been hot in July there. And now there are more um, features to notice because there's more buildings, there's more things, there's kind of, you know, tall buildings in some of the villages now. Back then, every church tower would have pretty much, much looked the same. So in your reading of both German accounts and Canadian and British accounts, just how diff difficult was navigation obviously they've got compasses obviously they've got maps there but with those kind of heat hazes and, ish, and dust and things like that are there cases of kind of mistaken identity and people kind of facing at the wrong ridge and just not quite sure where they are yes they they eventually they have to stop occasionally and there's there's um there's the case where they put the two universal carriers as three rtrs approaching borgibus ridge they race them through hubert foley just to see if there's any germans there you know, this is, and, and Colonel Silvertop has to stop and gain his orientation. Um, but, you know, as long as, you know, the, the main thing, as long as they just keep going south, <laughs> there's the Borgibus Ridge, there's no missing it. But um, the, due to the space, the, the second Fife and Forfar and the three RTR, they somewhat lose contact with each other as they push forward. And of course, um, Major General Pip Roberts, the commander of the 11th Armored Division, He's very much counting on follow-on forces making their appearance to help him if he does encounter heavy Germans. Now, I haven't really spoke about the German lines of defenses. I can say a couple of words upon that. Um, of course, the first line is somewhat the, the cannon fodder with just a few Panzer IVs from the, uh, the Panzer Regiment 22 and the 16th Luftwaffe Feld Division right in front of um, the, the airborne bridgehead. Then the second line of defense is uh, the units of the 21st Panzer Division. Um, you know, Major uh, Von Luck, he's the commander of one of the, the battle groups for the 21st Panzer Division. He's returning from Paris from leave as, as this great calamity is occurring. And then there's the third line of defense, these rough lines, rough groupings. The third line is the two artillery regiments of the 16th Luftwaffe Feld Division and the 21st Panzer Division. And they're on top of Borgibus Ridge. And you have the, the, the final line of defense, the, the Panzer Jäger Abtilung, uh, I think it's uh, 200 with the anti-tank guns for the 21st Panzer Division, and the Pioneer Battalion. But that's pretty much it. And Roscoe Harvey of the 29th British Armored Brigade, he's winning. He's spectacularly succeeding. And he has two Armored regiments, two full battle groups with the 23rd Hussars of, of Lieutenant Colonel Harding coming up to the rear. So he's about to capture Borgibus Ridge. He's about to destroy these two armored reg or artillery regiments in the open and push over Borgibus Ridge to potentially logger or bed down for the night and its forward slope, having achieved everything that Richard O'Connor, the 8th Corps commander, wants to, to do. And Despite the best efforts of the 21st Panzer Division, they're on their last legs. Uh, many of their units have been bypassed. I'll talk more about later on in the show about the Canadians and, and pushing down successfully around the uh, southern bank of the Orne. But on the Borgibus Ridge, um, the, the, the 29th Armored Brigade is about to attack it. The Guards Armored Brigade, the 5th Guards Armored Brigade under Brigadier Guatkin, he's taking on the left flank. Uh, to secure that against potential assaults, the German panzer resources that are available are rather pathetic. And due to the, the amount of cratering, they just can't drive the Tiger I tanks to, to, to engage this mass. And when they do, it doesn't, it doesn't turn out very well for them. Uh, the, the guards, the Coldstream guards, encounter some of these Tiger II tanks. And in the first engagement of the war with Tiger II tanks, uh, the British knock them out, several of them. Of course, it's a huge traffic jam, but there's plenty of 17-pounder uh, fireflies. And uh, Lieutenant Ulmer of the, the, the German 1st Panzer Company of Schwer Panzer Abtilung 503 shoots up several of them. He, he has several of them shot up, I believe, his command tank. And 
you know, um, falls into a bomb crater. And I haven't really spoken about Cagney. We have the famous story of uh, Major Major von Luck arriving um, as this the British masses of British tanks are passing by it. He runs up to the uh, the Luftwaffe, you know, um, flak 8.8 centimeter uh, guns. He says, you know, either earn yourself a medal or a bullet. And they, you know, immediately redeploy their 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 flak guns and shoot up C Squadron, the second Fife and Four Four Yarmouthry. Um, people have contested the, the the veracity of this story with Major von Luck, and I also have to say at this point, during the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there the British Army tours of Goodwood have sort of built up a myth of Goodwood saying it was mainly the 21st Panzer Division and the various personalities that they paraded out that said, you know, this this did that, this did this, and this is how we'll fight the Russians in the, the central front to, to, to beat back our major Russian attack with all their T-55s and T-62s. But it was politically unacceptable to talk about the major um, impact of the 1st SS Panzer Division because... Its members were, of course, members of the SS, the Waffen SS. And so during the British Battle Army battlefield tours, the impact of the Waffen SS and the Liebsten Data was somewhat played down. And people like Tiger Commander von Rosen and Major von Luck were paraded around and they put on a good show. And, you know, everybody smiles and has a great time and say, this is how we'll best the Russians. Don't you worry. NATO will beat them back. But the major events of the Borgibus Ridge, and this was mainly the, the large portion or purpose of this book, was to talk about the 1st SS Panzer Corps rushing forward to save the day for the 21st Panzer Division that's on its last legs and about to be defeated by Pip Roberts and his dashing armored brigadier, Roscoe Harvey. So take a break there, but yes, and Cagney, guess what else shows up there? Oh, if you could just go back to where you were to show them that map there for a second, just two seconds ago. The map, hmm. hang on. There we go. go hang on. Yeah. Hang on. Hang on. I'm just turning away. Yeah. No, no, no. That's not the wrong. That's Bergwiz. Hang on. I knew this happened. Here we go. Hang on. There we go. Right. There you go. Now, Von Luck wants to take credit for this, but guess who shows up in Cagney to bolster the defense, much to the disgust and you know, dismay of the, the guards' armored division? The sphere, or is it here's sphere pack abtulung 1039 with its you know 27 or 24 88 millimeter guns, and they deploy them higgledy piggledy throughout Cagney, but it becomes a, a, a strong point bristling with anti-tank firepower. And so the guards struggle with Cagney all day long until they put in an infantry attack on it, and the the, the 8.8 .8 millimeter gunners are forced to withdraw. But um, there's a huge battle between the second battle battalion, the Grenadier Guards, and the 5th Guards Armored Brigade, and it runs on all day long. But this this 88 millimeter battalion, you know, it's 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 the impact of it derails the advance of the guards towards Vimont and pushes them to the north. And and you know they see what's going on in the south in this apocalypse that's I'm about to talk about for for Burgibus Ridge. You know what happens exactly when. Um, Roscoe Harvey and his two lead armored regiments hit the first forward slopes and the villages that, that surround it. And now tell me at what point you want to do Grunthaville because I want that ready. Oh, yes. ready to sure, we can do Grunthaville and it's uh, it's a good story of major. Let's, Bill let's Close. Do so, so folks, you bear with us in this because Arthur's having to go stop and start. I'm having to bring up the right thing, but this is the thing about live stuff. So we're uh, we're into Grand Gondoville now. Some of the footage I really like taking because I was high on the railway line looking around the battlefield. It's a good overview of what things are going. So we'll we'll leap back and forth in the story, but I'll I'll play that as we go. So again, the red arrow is where I am. So Bill Close, lead armored squadron OC officer commanding of A Squadron Three or Chair, and because I'm mistaken, hopefully not, but he comes to. You know, he says, okay, I've got to cross over this north-south Chim de Fer Minier railway line that's for the, the mines and the steelworks. Um, and he's, he comes with his lead tanks and he says, right, you, through through there. And the, 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 the tank commanders in East Squadron look at him and they, they, they won't do it. They won't do it. 
And uh, he has to charge through under that underpass and they all follow him. And then he deploys out into open country. And he thinks, oh my gosh, this is it. We've, we've broken through. There's no Germans here. This is it. We've, we've done it. We've done it, boys. And then they, they see Borgibus Ridge and Hubert Foley and Bra in the, in the, in the, in the, um, <clears throat> in the distance and the height of Borgibus Ridge, which it doesn't look like much perfect. there. David O'Keefe made the point in the sidebar is that when you, and I said it earlier, when you film these things, the camera flattens out everything there. But if you're actually standing in that location there, folks, the Borgibus Ridge in the background there is, it's definitely looks more dominant than it does in that film footage there. But you can still see it. You can still see it is an obvious rise there. So as they come in and they cross the, the Con Viamont Road, Con Viamont raised railway line, they're, they're heading for it. And they do the recce through Hubert Foley and Silvertop fears, okay, it's good going. We'll just we'll press through here. And just as the commander, you know, Scott from the 2nd and Fife and 4 4, he's pushing at the same time simultaneously um, next to, uh, to, to uh, Four and Soliers in the vicinity of those villages to the east. At this time, at this very time, you know, roughly around 11 o'clock, 1100 hours, what's left of the 21st Panzer Division, what's left of the armored artillery regiments, what's left of the Pioneer Battalion, and what's left of, you know, what flak units of the 3rd Flak Corps have deployed forward? They give it to the 1st, the, the, the British 29th Armored Brigade with everything they got. They open fire all at once. It's nearly simultaneous. And the second Fife and Fofar and three RTR each lose about 12 to 13 tanks in a very short period of time. It's, it's not anarchy, but uh, the, 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 the control of the squadron commanders at this time is lessened as the British tank commanders are pulling back, pulling back as fast as they can. Left stick, right stick, left stick, right stick with the Sherman tanks. Of course, the, the 8.8 and 7.5 centimeter shells just go through them right through the front hill, right through the engine, right out the back. And, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible, but that's the state of British and Canadian and American tank technology at this time. And so they, they give them this tremendous bloody nose. And as, as the 29th Armored Brigade, despite Roscoe Harvey saying, here comes the 23rd Harfsars, don't give up, keep on pressing. You know, you talk a lot about Ufstrad tactics and fingertip control of the battlefield. Roscoe Harvey has it. He's got it. And dis but despite the, the best efforts, he's getting shot to pieces. And then as this firefight continues and the British pull back a bit and they continue this back and forth and they reorganize themselves, a certain group is pushing. They're pushing up from Garcelles Secville. They're driving as fast as they can. And they, they had aimed to take over a section of the 86th Army Corps area. And at the height or at the lead of this, this armored charge is the, the second uh, company of SS Panzer Regiment 1. The, the, the first Abtilungs, the Panzer Abtilung, the Panther Tank Battalion. Hans Malcolms, he's one of the Panther Tank Company commanders. He's got 13 of them. And he's pushing. He's pushing hell bent for leather. He's, you know, 10 minutes out, five minutes out, four minutes out. And of course, this time, every German Panther tank commander as they're pushing forward. Of course, the first SS Panzer Corps has been ordered to plug the gap to save the situation of the 21st Panzer Division, to defend Borgibus Ridge, to complete, to carry out a massive reorganization, um, a massive maneuver in broad daylight, the sky black with fighter bombers, of course, the RAF. The United States Army Air Force owning the skies with thunderbolts, typhoons, lightnings, everything. The German tank commanders, they're not looking forward. They're looking at the skies. But Malcolm's, he's pushing forward towards Soliers with everything he's got. And he reaches it just as the British 29th Armored Brigade is, is reorganizing itself. He shoots his way into the village of Soliers, destroying whatever... A second Fife and 4 4 Euromony tanks are nearby. And he establishes an all round hedgehog defense with the Panther tanks. There's no appreciable German infantry presence in Soliers. Maybe there's a few stragglers. Of course, helping Malcolm's is the, the Stug Abtilung 200 with its uh, French chassis 
you know, tanks of Major Becker, the, the Abtilon commander. And these, you know, each one of these batteries is very much conducting at this time a running battle with the British. Of course, they're not real tanks. They're just self-propelled guns. They can't carry out an armored, you know, some kind of armored assault or sustained battle. So they take a few shots at the Brits, pull back, next firing position, pull back, next firing position. But they're helping. They're helping. And so Malcolm's is joined by the other three companies of the Panther Abtilum. And each one of them, if you go back to the, the, uh, the first uh, map there, and this is in Solier, so you imagine... Uh, Soliers just just bristling with Panther tanks and the Stugs of the the French chassis uh, 21st Panzer Division Stug Abtilon 200, and slowly but surely each one of the Panthers companies makes contact. Now the Panthers act very differently from the Tigers. Michael Whitman is there. He's the commander of of SS Sphere Panzer Abtilon 101, and. He discusses with uh, Sturbenfuhrer Kuhlman on how exactly they're going to make this play, how they're going to conduct their armored assaults. The Tigers stay on top of Borgibus Ridge using the long-range Tiger 88 millimeter guns. They don't charge down. But led by the company commanders who, you know, very soon they become out of control as they fight their own battle. Malcolm's and his three other company commanders, they charge right in the midst of of the, the three RTR positions or very close to them, as well as the um, the, uh, the the second Fife and Forfer uh, positions. Eventually, during the the, the 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 battle that goes on for you know at least an hour and a half, they're pushed back. But at this time, the 23rd Hussars begin to make their appearance, and so the British they begin to to reorganize themselves and think about what's their next move. And of course, as the afternoon wears on, it's a race against time. It's a race against time. The Brits have to get enough combat power there to take Borgibus Ridge. And of course, um, the 1st SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment and the 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment, they're marching forward. They can't be trucked forward because of the damn fighter bombers, the Yabos. So they're marching as fast as they can, but they're terrified. They're hiding in the ditches. So there's a second armored attack at roughly 1,600, 1,700. Of course, Piss, Pip Roberts has brought up the Armored Recce um, Battalion of the, the 11th Armored Division. And a, a company, uh, was a commander's conference has taken place at this time. They're going to make another, another, um, another go at it. But the Germans, as the British are refueling, rearming, bombing up, and the North, the second North, North Hans Yeomanry is about to make its attack, a, a second, no, a third German armored force approaches. It's the Sturmgeschutz Abtilung of the Liebstandata Adolf Hitler. And in a pincer movement supposedly orchestrated by the division commander of the Liebstandata, the Panthers and Tigers push forward and the Stugs, the Stug Threes push on the, the left flank there, the Western flank, and large numbers of 2nd North Hans Yeomanry Cromwells are destroyed, and whatever's left of the 29th Armored Brigade is pushed back, literally shot back into the quarry for 3 RTR, or very close to the raised um, railway line, which provides shelter for the, 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 the remnants of, of these three armored regiments. And this, of course, the second armored attack so they've had three good goes at the British until the evening, three good goes at them, and it's bought time. It's bought time for the SS Panzer Grenadier to reach the villages, to dig in, to create their forward outposts, to defend um, Borgibus Ridge and allow the 21st Panzer Division to exit. Of course, it's you know somewhat defeated, but it's got to redeploy to the west. And during this time, the 12th SS Panzer Division sent stupidly away to the coast to uh, see off another potential amphibious assault is brought back. You know, um, you know, it's it's a chaotic period of time. Is it under the 86th Corps? Is it under the 1st SS Panzer Corps? But, you know, the, the main point is it's it's going to get shoved into right where Cagney is to block the route from Viamont and, and to allow the 21st Panzer Division to reorient itself to the north around Trorn to put up uh, to a solid defensive line there. And thus, at the end of the 18th, 
the major day of Goodwood, the front congeals with the British, the main drive onto Borgibus Ridge being thwarted, and the 1st SS Panzer Division, Liebstandata, achieving a tactical victory in that it successfully defended Borgibus Ridge, which it maintains during the night. And all through the night, the SS Panzer Grenadier march and reorient themselves and deploy themselves in the various villages. And the, the tanks pull back on both sides to bomb up and get a few hours sleep. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break to take your take a breath there, Arthur. And people are absolutely loving your enthusiasm. They're loving the detail there. And um, just while Arthur's taking a break there, I just remind you folks that, of course, we're only a, tackling a part of what's available in Arthur's books. We, you know, there's lots more maps, lots more photos, lots more detail. We're only getting, giving you a kind of a, a snapshot, a greatest hits package, if you like. But hopefully this is bringing kind of the, 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 the action of Operation Goodwood to life. And as I said earlier, talking to Arthur, Goodwood often is used as this big debate about leadership and Dempsey and what Dempsey said to Montgomery, what Montgomery promised and what Dempsey promised. That at its heart, at its absolute heart, is, is what Arthur's been talking about, which is an incredibly visceral, violent battle. Uh, it's a large battle, but it breaks down to these small sort of, um, not it's unit actions, but these little locations for these choke points. So he's doing an incredible job there. So, we're, we're up to ninth. You know, you've talked about the events of the evening of 18th of July. So how, in your interpretation, you know, you just said there the Germans are going to pull back. How do both sides kind of feel right now? Who feels they've come out of this better? Is it or is it kind of hard to gauge? It's hard to gauge. The, the Germans have suffered tremendous losses in Panzer Regiment 22s, pretty much a write-off. The Tiger tanks have proved ineffectual. But on the good point, you know, who cares about these villages? Who cares about the southern... Um, Bank of the Orn. We have Borgipus Ridge, we have Verriers Ridge, and we have all these little villages or forward outposts. So let you know, let the British try if they want to try again. And there's so it's almost sort of a not not a rebellion, but the divisional commanders at the end of the Eighth Corps. You know, O'Connor sort of throws his hands up and he says, "What what more can be done?" Because Pip Roberts and the others, and Pip Roberts is very unhappy on the 18th because he feels that. The British 7th Armored Division and the British 22nd Armored Brigade could have intervened violently to potentially provide him with that combat power. And, you know, there's the famous story of Brigadier Looney Hines showing up and saying, oh, there's too many tanks here anyway, and pulls back. And, and you know, both Hind and Erskine, the division commander, are removed shortly after Goodwood. And, and they, but at the same time, they know they see the carnage and that perhaps influences their their decisions to we are not going to see the british 22nd armored brigade destroyed today and so we'll only attack tentatively and so the the 19th is pretty much a day of the division commander saying listen we need to sort out these these little stone villages and we need to use our previous tactics that we've used uh, conquering parts of normandy already and that's how they do it and Brass falls. There's a tremendous amount of SS Panzer Grenadier that are taken prisoner. Hubert Folly falls. Um, Soliers, the combat outposts, take off. They pull back as 5RTR sweeps through the village. 5RTR and part of 1RTR approach 4. And there's still long-distance tank battles going on, and the Germans push in in the very on, on, um, early in the day in an attempt to, to savage the British Armored Regiments again. But guess who's arrived? the Royal Artillery, with all their tank destroyers and anti-tank guns, and they're ready for the Germans, so it doesn't really work out for them. The Germans pull back. But uh, uh, Borgibus, it's 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 one objective too many, and the Germans manage to fight them off. And they, they pull back their combat outposts, and they, they give up the villages. But at the same time, O'Connor, he sees this as des descending into a piecemeal Rather than an armored charge or a breakout, it's just a grinding, attritional tank battle of firefights because every single Tiger tank in the area is there. Every single Panther that's available is there, as well as the German anti-tank guns. They've had the entire night to, to redeploy and organize themselves. They know what they're doing. And the, the Germans, but they're also, the Germans haven't deployed their, their entire strength. The Panzer IV Battalion has not been pushed forward because the Germans are still terrified they're terrified of another aerial assault, another bombardment. So they can't, it's very much the thinking in depth. We have to continue to be in depth. So 
The 12th SS pushes in, but there's very limited action with the Guards Armored Division. And it's even less on the 20th, as the only significant thing that happens on the 20th is, um, I think, a couple more villages to the, to the east fall, um, close to Fernouville, Fernouville Falls on the, the, the 21st. And the 4th, and say it right, the city of London Yeomanry pushes forward to Trotteval Farm. And they actually, it's, you know, it's not a couple of tanks, it's the whole freaking battle group. And they push forward. Uh, next to Trotteval Farm, but they find out the Canadians are pushing in on, on the last phase of what they believe will be a successful day of for Operation Atlantic, and they pull back. But at the same time, and this is also forgotten by Canadian military historians, the 4th CLY, the country, City of London Yeomanry, they, they ambush with uh, fireflies, uh, a group of Panzer IVs that were dead set for the Fusilier Montréal, allowing the Fusilier Montréal to successfully take Trotteval Farm. Well, the rest of the battalion gets badly beaten to the west on Verrier's Ridge. They succeed at Trotteval, and it's largely due to the British armor fighting this this battle. Well, let's 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 load up the Trotteval Farm uh, video, and, we, and this is the kind of point we are now transitioning from the Bourgabooth Ridge now to the Verrier Ridge. I mean, it's as you said in, in, in the introduction, there, it's kind of they they're, they're kind of the same ridge, but kind of differently named. It sort of hooks into the other one, but well, this kind of is a, a halfway point in the show to move to the, the events there. So I'll, the Trotteval Farm is somewhere I have to say, until you sent me out there filming, I I had read about it, but I'd never been there, and it's another one of those flat areas with a farm in the middle of nowhere. But I really enjoyed going there, so I'll I'll put up that video there and explain a little bit more about about the next part of the action, uh, Arthur. So here we go, Trotteval Farm. All right, so. Uh, uh, we will back up to, you know, talk about, do, do you want me, Paul, to talk about the first two days of Operation Atlantic here before we, sure. yeah, I'll, I'll give it a quick overview. You tell me what you want to do, Arthur, and I'll yeah. do that. Yes. Um, well, um, the as Goodwood is raging with the British 8th Corps charging forward, uh, the Canadian 2nd Corps under its, its commander, Lieutenant General Guy Granville Simmons, arguably more British than Montgomery. He uh, conducts a very successful, partly amphibious operation over the Orne and pushing down from his tiny chunk of the airborne bridgehead, he pushes through the column bells. There's a chateau there that they have to conduct repeated airstrikes on, but it falls. The, the Luftwaffe, uh, Jaeger are pushed back. They push through the steelworks, part of Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192 is defeated. It's all going very, very well. They're racing down the, the southern bank of the Orne. And this is something very important that, that I don't know why the Germans don't do this. I don't, I feel it de deals with their, their belief in depth. They don't defend strongly the southern bank of the Orne. And the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division conducts a successful amphibious assault. And by the, the 19th, bridges are being erected and they're pushing through the southern um, suburbs of Caen, the, the Faubourg, I was at Faubourg de Vassels, and, and pushing forward. And as the 19th draws to, a, to you know, the dawn of the 19th, things are going very, very successfully. They only have elements of one and a bit battalions of the 272nd Infantry Division of General Lieutenant uh, Schack. One is across the river at, uh, at uh, Lovigny. The other one's uh, guarding the, 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 the southern bank of the Orne, but only providing a, a, a very limited line of outposts. And as the Canadians are crossing, they get bombarded. There's still an artillery battalion from the 12th SS Panzer Division, Hitlerjugend, which has been left behind with the 272nd Infantry Division, but they can only put up token resistance. And the Canadians push forward and they sweep through and they have very successful days and they're very much savaged and somewhat destroyed armored brigade of the British Armored Division um, um, is, is, is relieved by the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division that pushes down from the steelworks, takes over from the Brits. And the, the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division pushes through fleury sur orne ifs, and they come across this point, point 67, and they see in the distance a height from this, this height that they have, you know, point 67, 
They see across the river into the second SS Panzer Corps area, but they see St. Andre Soron, they see Beauvoir Farm, they see Trottevel Farm, they see St. Martin de Fontenay, and they see Verrieres Ridge and its height, 0.88. And so this is very good, and they continue to bring up their tanks and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, and it's almost like a very successful river crossing for Guy Simmons, and he's done this before in Italy. There's a million rivers in Italy. And it's very much an infantry first operation. And he is doing it very, very well. There's nothing really going wrong. The Germans are fighting just like in Italy, delaying actions, occasionally fighting quite hard, then pulling back. And the 1st SS Panzer Division, its focus is almost entirely on the British 8th Corps and attacking the British 11th Armored Division, Guards Armored Division, and British 7th Armored Division. But when the show to the east with O'Connor and the British 8th Corps largely grinds to a halt on the 20th. And O'Connor has lost interest in it now, and you know he's looking towards the next operation. Borgibus Ridge is firmly in the hands of the Germans. There's a million guns up there. What are we going to do? We have to replan, and you know where is the strategic focus going to be next, You know, General Dempsey? But for the Canadians, Atlantic is going spectacularly well. And the 2nd Armored Canadian Armored Division, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, I meant to say, supported by units of the 2nd Canadian Armored Brigade. They push on to Hill 67. And here we see the first start of German resistance on the, I believe it's the night of the 19th. A few Liebstandata Panthers approach point 67 and they're they're driven off as, as they, they push them back. Um, so, so uh, the um, what was it? What am I saying? The um, yes, the, the the stage is set for a final dash by Lieutenant General Simmons onto Verrier's Ridge. You know, he'll he'll succeed, or he thinks he will, and you know, be very much you know get a pat on the head by Dempsey, and he'll have caught captured this this dominating height and something the British Eighth Corps hadn't done to the east on Borgibus Ridge, and of course despite the hedges and the, the trees and things having built up back in 1944, these are bone dry fields of wheat. Very, very good for tanks. And reverse slope positions, front slope positions, everything like that. You can see, you can see point 67 from the other side of the Orne River. You can see it from Barriers Ridge. And it is now with the British 8th Corps shutting Goodwood down somewhat that the Germans and the Liebstandata, Adolf Hitler, can race over to the, the, the aid of the very much beleaguered, overwhelmed, largely horse-drawn 272nd Infantry Division and to secure, to secure Verrier's Ridge. So the 20th, they, um, they don't attack early in the day, but it takes starts, you know, after some planning purposes and reorganization. They push forward with the Sherbrooke Fusiliers and the Camerons of Can uh, was it Highland? Uh, uh, is the 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 Camerons of Canada, the uh, the, the 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 Winnipeg um, Sixth Infantry Brigade um, Infantry Regiment? I'll get it later. Camerons of Canada, good enough. Um, the uh, the Queen's Own Cameron Highlanders of Canada. There you go. Got it. Anyway. The, well, now that's not failing. You're doing incredibly well. You're throwing all these names and units and a little a little uh, stumble every now and then. I do it all the time, Arthur. So yeah. uh, <laughs> this, again, folks, it's really get hard to get an idea. Very A Ridge is even harder to get a photo of in some ways than Borgaboos Ridge because when you're there, as I said, the camera just fattens things out. But it is the, this footage, I hope, I hope folks, is, is helping you out to kind of understand this terrain. So the 20th dawns in the afternoon of the 20th, and this is going to be a brigade operation, not a multi-brigade operation. Some parts of other brigades, the 4th Canadian Infantry Brigade will be involved, but it's mainly Brigadier Young. It's been detailed by Simmons. You carry on. Of course, Simmons micromanages everything. The divisional commanders, the brigade commanders, the, the CCRA, uh, for example, there are just, you know, they're, they're messengers for this, this massive plan that he's orchestrated and tightly, tightly controlled. And of course, he sees infantry as the hammer. And that, you know, there's no real comprehension. That this is one of the points that I bring forward, and I bring forward even more forcefully in the second book. 
that Simmons will have to fight, whether he likes it or not, an armored battle, a tank battle. And this is coming at him, whether he likes it or not. And that's, but at the same time, he pushes these infantry first attacks. These fellows just walking through the wheat with a 303 or a Bren gun, you know, anti-tank guns, you know, following them as fast as they can. But the Camerons, they have the Camerons on one side to see St. Andre Sir Arns, St. Martin, the South Saskatchewan Regiment to go through the center to actually seize point 88, only one battalion to attack the center of the ridge. It's, it's almost penny packeting, penny packeting of Canadian forces. Rather than maximum force, we have minimum force. And to the left, the Franco uh, Fusilier Montréal to seize Trotteville and Beauvoir Farms and to push forward into, into uh, Verrières. So they push forward. And then as the attacks are going in, something terrible happens. It starts to rain intensively. And the, 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 the fighter bomber air support, the Yabos, the heated Yabos, the Germans look to the skies and they see where it's black with fighter bombers before they've all gone. And as they see the approaching Canadians, uh, 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 but the Camerons do quite well. They launch something called a, a murder barrage and a murder bombardment, a huge concentration to destroy the second battalion of the 982nd Grenadier Regiment. And it largely forces them out of St. Andre and parts of St. Martin, and they retreat to the south. The Camerons storm in, and they, they form with uh, the Sherbrooke Fusilier Squadron that's supporting them, a, um, uh, a fortress in the part of the buildings and the orchard to the north of St. Andre. The, the, the South Saskatchewan Regiment charges through the wheat, and they get onto point 88, or very close to it. And so imagine if you could imagine yourself walking out, you know, on a summer vacation in the middle of the wheat, and then as a member of the South Saskatchewan Regiment, and then the equivalent of, say, five or six four-by-four four trucks driving at high speed, charging right through the wheat to you. These are the Panzer IV tanks of, of the, the 5th and 6th Panzer Company in the, in the pouring rain coming through. And they drive right into the South Saskatchewan Regiment, despite the fact that the anti-tank guns are almost set up. They're almost ready for the German tanks. The, but the Germans run right into them. The battalion commander, Major acting commander, Major Matthews, is killed. The, the, the Germans, they're rotating their tank tracks. They're driving around in circles. It's absolute anarchy. And the South Saskatchewan Regiment, in a tremendously short amount of time, it's dispersed, defeated, driven back. And the uh, reserve battalion for the 4th Canadian Infantry Brigade, the Essex Scottish, are there, right there. And seeing this, the SSR, the South Saskatchewan Regiment, you know, flailing back, and the panzers, the tank fire from the, the bark of the tank cannon and the machine gun coaxes, you know, it, 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 it puts them very much in, a, in a, a very uneasy position. And on the, on the right-hand side, not the, I mean the left flank, the Fusilier Montréal benefit very much from the 4th City of London Yeomanry blasting the living daylights, ambushing the Panzer IVs, and they charge into Trotteville Farm. But as they go through, what is lurking in the cellars and in the fields of the wheat? The uh, the Uf SS Panzer Uf, Uf Clarong Abtilong 1 soldiers from the reconnaissance companies, they've been deployed as infantry. They begin to, to form a concentric counterattack on the, the FMR, Fusilier Montréal companies, and the SS Panzer Grenadier storm out of the wheat, and they shoot at the French Canadians as they're from, from the back, and they come out of the cellars and ambush them. And during a brutal battle, they manage to seize control of Trotteville Farm, the Canadians, but the other three companies, or no, the other two companies to the uh, west near Beauvoir Farm are pushed back. Um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gavro, the, the Franco uh, Infantry Battalion Commander, forms a, a firm base, but the C Company under Major um, Major Mosso is largely isolated at Trotteval Farm as night falls. So as night falls, the Essex Scottish are being menaced and being engaged by the Panzer IVs that are pushed up for their position. Uh, the Camerons are stuck in in the orchard, but more German forces are being brought up to counterattack them. And this is just the beginning of the battle. And largely Canadian military historians have largely 
not disregarded, but not given enough, enough attention to the events of the 21st and the 22nd of July, the Sherbrooke Fusiliers and then the Camerons of Canada in St. andre sur orne and St. Martin are pushed to their absolute limits in this epic tank battle that goes on for the better part of, of, of nearly three days. And the first vanguard of these armored reinforcements, it's just not all the Liebstandata, guess who's arrived? The second Panzer Division, Panzer Regiment Three, in the advance party of Panther tanks, the regimental uh, commander, Oberst Kohn, in a personal recce, he engages a member, uh, some portions, the Sherbrooke Fusiliers in St. Martin. And in the firefight that results, he's killed. This is a tremendous blow to the, the Panzer Regiment three forces that are storming in to try to shore up what's been going on in St. Andre and push them back. So as you see the perfect tank country there, this is absolutely perfect for the Panzer force, who despite it being you know a more ancient German tank, it's very effective against the Canadians. And of course, the, the, the SSR are virtually um, defenseless against this attack. They're, they're savage. They're, they're, they're driven to the four winds back. And then the Essex Scottish, you know, are very much not shaking in their boots, but they're very apprehensive about what's coming the next day. So when the next day comes for the Essex Scottish, they wake up, light breaks over the battlefield. They look up. And the Panzer IVs are there. And in an all-day battle, they engage them. And this is something very tragic. People say that the Essex Scottish broke. Two companies did withdraw very hurriedly to avoid death. But the two reverse res reserve companies pushed forward on the 20, the 21st. If we could go to the map to the, the 21st, this is the attacks on the 20th you see right there. So this is, you see there on the 21st, the Essex Scottish remains getting attacked. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel McDonald, this is, it's a terrible story and it's difficult for me to say, but he approaches several armored commanders for help to, and, you know, to, to gain an armored counterattack. It eventually comes that evening in the form of the Black Watch and a massive artillery bombardment that, that uh, straightens out the line. But the Essex Scottish from the daybreak right until the evening are savaged by the Panzer IVs and the SS Panzer Grenadier that have, you know, sort of tootled off after the, the German tanks and are engaging them as well. In a, in a desperately one-sided battle, a large group of the Essex Scottish surrender. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel MacDonald barely escapes. He's running off to, to not running off, but seeking aid for his battalion. And the Panzer IV sur surround a group of uh, the Essex Scottish and they're forced to, to, uh, to surrender. But it's not for lack of fight. They hold the line. They do. And despite, you know, uh, tremendous, tremendous losses. And I believe MacDonald very, uh, very sincerely said this. He does his absolute best. At the same time, this is not, um, you know, talked about very much on the 21st. The, the, the Liebstandata Panthers, what, which ones of them are still running, still battle ready, they drive right down the Route Nationale 158, right down the road, right up to IFS, and conduct a battle with uh, the, the anti-tank guns around IFS. And, um, and, and, but they're forced back by the massive defensive fire, but this is just these Panthers driving forward to support the actions at the Trotteval Farm. You're saying, what actions at the Trotteval Farm? Well, to take back the Trotteval farm and really do the business to the Fusilier Montreal, guess who arrives? Hamsterfuhr, Michael Wittmann, and of course, in a in a swimming wagon now because he's the battalion commander, and several Tiger tanks, the third company of the Sphere SS uh, Panzer Abtilung uh, 101, push forward, and you see there's very much detail of. Um, I forget his name, but he's a foo, a foo at Trotteval Farm. He's now he's a major property developer here in Kingston. My brain is my brain is forgetting his. He's a he's an RCA foo with the uh, Fourth Field Regiment, I believe. And he, uh, despite his best efforts against the sustained uh, German assaults, Brett Smith. Two, yes, Brett Smith. Brett Smith. He he wants questions. He, yes. <laughs> DF fire task against DF fire task, Mike target after Mike target, beating the Germans back. 
but slowly but surely they encroach. Major Mossov's C Company eventually surrenders. There's only a handful of men left at this time. Britt Smith jumping in his universal carrier of his food team. They escape the food, the food carrier, the universal carrier, T-16. I forget which one it is. It's raked by MG-34 fire, tire, fire from the Tiger tank. Bits and pieces of it run off, but he escapes. He's wounded during spring as he has a rather short war, but it's very intense. And he manages to make it back to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gavreau and the headquarters and A Company of FM, the, the Fusilier Montreal, which is pretty much all that's left of them. And so, yes, uh, Britt Smith, he, he allows the, the resistance to carry on at Trotteval and put up a very good fight. But the Germans, they just want these two, these two farms and to push the Canadians back away from Verrier's Ridge. And they've largely done that. And as they're doing that, the, the two correct to finally, they finally react. After seeing the Essex Scottish savaged all day long from Six o'clock in the morning, right until five o'clock at night, the Black Watch of the 5th Canadian Infantry Brigade finally attack under a massive, massive artillery bombardment. They're supported by um, the first Tassars. People say, mistakenly, I believe that the Sherbrooke Fusiliers were involved in this as one of the flanking armored forces. It's just the first Tassars. And the Black Watch advance. They push over Hill 61 to its front slope and restore the line along the road, along the, the, the road to, to St. Martin and St. Andre. You see on the rolling tank country, of course, sometimes they could see the German tanks. And the German tanks can see them, but actually having the gun power on the Sherman three, this short-barreled 75-millimeter gun, or this even the 17-pounder, to actually reach out and attack and engage that, that group of... Um, uh, Allied tanks or German tanks, it just wasn't there. And on the 21st, there's increased battles in St. Andre, Saron, as the second Panzer Division forces arrive and the the the, the uh, Grenadier Regiment 982 forces, just the second battalion, reform themselves and they attack. But the Camerons of Canada hold on and they drive them back. And there's several very heavy counterattacks that aren't mentioned in Canadian military history accounts, but Lieutenant Colonel Ross and, of course, the OC of A Squadron, Major uh, Sidney Radley Walters in an epic tank battle all day long on the 21st, pushes them back. And as the Panther tanks attempt to swirl around point sixty seven and, and maneuver back and forth, Radley Walters, using all the uh, his tactical expertise, he closes the range. And at the same time, you see it there, the war winner, the 25-pounder, the, the jewel, the crown jewel of the RCA, the Royal Canadian Artillery, Royal Artillery, the winner of the, the Normandy campaign beats the Germans back in never-ending barrages. Piles of ammunition get consumed as the barrels get the paint burned right off them as the Germans are beaten back as they reform and push forward again. Now, the Cameron story, just like David O'Keefe says there, he's watching this, this uh, podcast here today. He's, he's a great author. You should buy both of his books, uh, One Day in August and Seven Days in Hell. Please buy them. Um, the, um, the, the story of Cameron's and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ross, it's been, I don't know, buried by history. A book needs to be written about it and the Battle of St. Andre and the battles in St. Martin and how... Um, Ross and his Camerons managed to hold out. And so it's one of those tremendously excellent books, you know, that, that it's just about, you know, it's lurking out there, about to be dropped. Um, but, um, you know, there's much more to be said. People said um, Normandy's, a, you know, a written book, you know, a, a tire tread that's been beaten down 150 million times. There's nothing left to write about, I believe, very much differently. And so, yeah, no, definitely, Arthur. And just, and just to interrupt there, I, I just come back from the We Have Ways Festival in, in England over the weekend. And of course, they had, I think it was four 25 pounders there. So they, 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 they had Monty's men in Atman Group doing moving across wheat fields with infantry. They had a couple of Sherman tanks. And they had four, four Sherman tanks firing. So, you know, those who were there were able to see a very, very mini and a very, very condensed and safe version of these kind of assaults on, on hills like Hill 112 and Point 67. 
And I'm with you, Arthur. The 25-pounder is an unsung hero of World War II. We talk about the winning factors. We talk about L- LC- uh, LCAs, LCVs. We talk about the jerry can, the dark, uh, the, the spitfire. But for my money, the 25-pounder is right up there as one of those incredibly, incredibly brilliant tools and the bigger ones, the 3.7s and the 5.5s. But I'm just going to let Arthur you know, recover his, his voice again. But this... Folks, this is the Point 67 Memorial now, because I said earlier that the area around both Borgabus Ridge and, and Verrier Ridge has been expanded. The villages are bigger than they were there. So this is kind of the focal point for visitors there. So you just got to take a little turning off, off, off the main road just north of St. Andres, uh, and, and there's this incredible memorial there. I believe David Patterson is watching as part of the, the, the setting up of this. And it's an incredible place. If you haven't been there, you're going to Normandy and you haven't been there, Definitely go there because it's got these lovely map boards. It's got these informational panels. You know what you're looking at, and it's an exceptional view of the battlefield there. Um, so I'll, I'll play that while Arthur continues talking. Yes, so the, the the battle with the Camerons and the Sherbrooke Fuselers, it goes on into the night. as The, the Camerons very determinedly, they don't conquer all of St. Andre. They don't conquer all of St. Martin but they push the Germans back so that their, their grip on it is somewhat reduced. And of course, the, the, this 272nd Infantry Division, it's, it's doing the absolute best it can, but is it, is it properly equipped? It's largely horse-drawn in a First World War fashion. And the, all these guns of the RCA, all these guns of the Royal Artillery, they're pounding the living daylights out of the 272nd Infantry Division, portions of which are made up of Poles, of, of Volksdeutsch, that have no particular allegiance to Adolf Hitler, very much want to get out of the war and use this as their, their, their great opportunity. So the 272nd Infantry Division, it's despite Schack doing his best, it, he very much needs Kampfgruppe Kohn, Battlegruppe Kohn. Of course, the Kohn, Colonel Kohn now dead, but he needs to push them back. And of course, the 1st SS Panzer Corps is exerting pressure because uh, the, the Panzer Group West Commander, um, General der the Panzer Troop and Hans Eberbach very much wants the line straightened out. Hill 67 captured this, this hill that you're looking there. And, you know, the, the Panzer, 2nd Panzer Division forces he feels should be sufficient to um, take back this, this excellent tactical feature. You can see over the Orne. You can see into St. Andre. You can see all German movements. Kill 67.67, it's got to fall. That's the way the Germans see it. Of course, it's their fault that it fell in the first place due to the the, the thin crust of outposts that allow Hill 67 to fall to, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, the the Black Watch, they seize it and they drive off a um, a German German counterattack of of Liebstandata Panther tanks on the evening of the 19th before moving off to, to, to Ifs. Um, as more of the Canadian forces come into the, the fleury sur area. So the 22nd arrives and urgent f- fevered movement on the German side. The second Panzer Division forces have, have reorganized themselves, but they've received such a bloody nose in this all day tank battle against Major um, Radley Walters and East Water and the Sherbrook Fusiliers and various anti-tank weapons of uh, the, the RCA and the Cameron Highlanders that the second Panzer Division forces after combat on the 19th and the, the, the or on the 20th and the 21st are largely a beaten force. They need to take a break. They need to pull back. They need to recover some of these Panther tanks. We need more Panther tanks. Where are they going to come from? Well, the, the Liebstandata Panther Abtilung has largely, you know, been been badly beaten. It can support a little bit to, to counterattack near uh, St. Martin, but we need a new force. And it's going to come from across the river. The, the, the Panther Abtilung, the first Abtilung of SS Panzer Regiment 9 is moved across the river. But in the circumstance of war that badly lets down the German side, when the attack time comes at 0600, the Panthers are not there. They're still over the river. A group of three of them have arrived. A group of three under uh, an SS NCO for the second company. Uh, and these drive forward on a, on a personal recce through the wheat in the middle of the night. They can barely see anything, but they push forward. 
because they want to, to scout the ground in order to brief the company commander of 2nd Company SS Panzer Regiment 9 when he arrives with his Panthers. And they push forward and they push forward and mistakenly they push forward right next to Hill 61 in the Black Watch. And dawn breaks and the Germans look. Oh my God, we're surrounded by Canadians. Of course, he gives several lightning quick commands. The, the, the hatch covers slam down. The Panthers go into action. They shoot up a number of, of, of vehicles and machine gun the Black Watch a little bit. But as the situation is, Canadians begin to recover. He has to pull back towards Verrier's Ridge, which is three, um, despite staying there and shooting at the Canadians for a large period of time. So that tremendous opportunity for the Germans to infiltrate as they did with their Panther tanks. It's thrown away by the inability of the, the company or the regimental commander of SS Panzer Regiment 9, I believe it's Obersturbenfeuer Meyer, to push his Panther tanks across the Orne. Of course, they're still, you know, there's a million excuses. They're still fighting the British in the second SS Panzer Corps area. But guess who they're supposed to support in a major push? The uh, SS Panzer Aufklärung Abteilung 10 from the 10th SS Panzer Division, Frunsberg on the 22nd. He's been arranged in Maceron to push forward, to attack, to, to liberate, not liberate, but recapture. <laughs> For sure the French wouldn't like that me saying that. To recapture uh, St. Andre and clear St. Martin de Fontenay as well. And so the recce soldiers, they look around to their left, they look around to their right. There's no Panther tanks. And the artillery barrage is going in. Stubborn Fear Brinkman, he makes the call. He's got to attack. But guess who's waiting? Who's very much alerted? The Camerons of Canada. And they ambush the SS Panzer Grenadier as they push forward. And the tremendous uh, battle that goes on south of St. Andre, um, Sir Arne, takes place. The resistance, this is not mentioned in Canadian accounts of the fighting, takes place here in a, a farmhouse, which the Camerons have fortified. The, uh, there's, there's plenty of anti-tank guns. And then around 12, guess who finally shows up? Finally! SS Panzer Regiment 9 as Panthers. And stupidly, stupidly, there's a rise to the east or northeast of Maceron, a little rise, a little crest. And the Panther tanks, just as the, the, the Panther tanks from the 2nd Panzer Division did the previous day, they stupidly drive right over the crest and waiting for them is the Sherbrooke Fusiliers, as well as all the anti-tank guns of the RCA units, of the 6th Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment, as well as the 2nd Canadian Anti-Tank Regiment, uh, the, the, the uh, Divisional and Corps Anti-Tank Units uh, for the 2nd Canadian Corps and 2nd Canadian Infantry Divisions. And they have a field day, and they shoot up a pile of the, the, the Hohenstaufen, of course, it's 9th SS Panzer Division, Hohenstaufen Panther Tanks, despite some... You know, the, the beaten remnants of um, S or uh, Panzer Regiment 3 Panthers and part of Grenadier Regiment 980 that make a um, an attempt to, to, to save the situation. There's just no, the Canadian fire is way too harsh, or not hard, but too, too intense. And the Germans and the, the, the recce soldiers of SS Panzer Aufklärung Abteilung 10 are pushed back again. And thus, the Camerons have won again nearly unbeatable, invincible. They still hold large sections of St. Andre and St. Martin. And the Germans are beaten back to the approaches north of St. Uh, Maceron. And, but during this time on the 22nd, the Germans solidify with Grenadier Regiment 981, their hold on Verrier's Ridge. And in the great scheme of things, despite this tremendous victory won by Lieutenant Colonel Ross, the Camerons, Beating back the Germans, the Germans still hold the vi vital Verrier's Ridge. They still hold the Borgibus Ridge. The strategic points, the tactical positions, these topographical features, these dominating features, where, of course, it's not just not good for tank commanders, but for artillery spotters. You can see for miles. So the German uh, officers that are detached from the Nebelwerfe uh, rocket artillery units, as well as the 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 artillery regiments of 272nd Infantry Division, uh, the artillery regiments uh, for the, the Hitlerjugend and the Liebstandarte all utilize much to their, their, their benefit, Borgibus Ridge and the heights of Verrier's Ridge to look over everything. And of course, what small amounts of ammunition they have compared to the Anglo-Canadian forces use their, their best to, 
strategically, they're, they're husbanded rounds. They're very small number of Nibelwerfer and um, uh, howitzer rounds for their panzer artillery and artillery regiments. Uh, so the 22nd and the book ends, this book ends with uh, another victory the, 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 in the um, uh, victory at the, 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 by, the, by the, the Queen's own Cameron Highlanders and the Sherbrooke Fusiliers. But something very tragically has taken place during this time. The, the infantry regiments of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division, due to the fact of sending them first with just their, their, their 303s and their Bren guns, they've been savaged terribly by the Panzers. And it seems very tragically, Simmons never really understood what opposition he was facing how important these topographical features were to the Germans and the, the, the fact that he would have to fight, not only fight, but win with massive force, not penny packets of a squadron here and a squadron there, but massive tank forces to fight and to, to beat back the Germans. And the, very tragically, the Canadian infantry pay the price for this. Wow. I tell you what, Arthur, you have given Dr. Philip Blood a run for his money there. Because when Philip Blood comes on, I, people say I'm never more quiet than when he comes on. Often I interrupt, I join in. I've said I've said a few things today, but you you just you just had that absolutely um, had me in your um, in the palm of your hand there. So yeah, we've we've brought things to a natural conclusion, folk, for part one because. Part one it covers these few days, and part two, which will be whenever the book comes out, you said there may be dead December, maybe January, we'll pick up where we left off. So I'm going to remind you all, folks, that this is um, the first volume of Arthur's book. I'll put the, the banner up there. And the link, of course, is in the description below, folks. You know the score. You know how it works. Uh, pull, uh, look in the description on YouTube, and you'll find the link to uh, Arthur's book, to my resources and things like that, and Arthur's on Twitter as well. So... Uh, incredible show and um I've, I've done my best to try and bring in the video at the right places and um as people are saying there so much information well, we need to be watched again at half speed so there we go that's that uh, so um yeah we, we will do you have, are you okay to take a few questions if you have any now absolutely sounds great so folks if you have any questions there we'll, we'll bring some questions so we will do it about this part of it don't kind of can ask questions now about operation spring the next part we'll do that in the next show and if you want a, a, a taster of that david o'keefe of course did a, an operation spring show and it's about the black watch that was about uh two summers ago i guess that was now david wasn't it It wasn't one summer ago. it must be two weeks two two summers ago so questions have we got any questions there coming in People just saying outstanding. Uh, David, uh, one of the outstanding performance, sir, says um, David David O'Keefe. Um, Bradley is saying thank you for a, a great time. Andrew Skitt, who became a patron a couple of days ago, thank you very much. A, 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 uh, Andrew says excellent show. David Gregg, another show that makes my top 10 World War II TV list. Well, you should be proud of it, Arthur, because at 540 shows, making the top 10 is, is pretty good. And Ivan is saying he appreciates the video of the actual battlefield. So, any questions, folks? If you have, far away. If not, we will things things to an end. So um, Darren Little saying another needs another viewing. Um, Alexander Black is saying they the key was taking positions and bringing up six and seventeen pounders, but in this case, the counterattack came in too soon for that deployment. So um, I'll, I'll ask you a question. I mean, obviously, we we must pay tribute to Mike Bechtold's incredible map work because. It's helped our show out today and it's helped your book. And he's currently doing the book, the maps for your volume too. So Mike is watching. So uh, just a big shout out because everybody re watching these shows, everybody reading books, so often the maps in books are either just not, not good enough or there are not enough of them. And Mike is probably the world's premier World War II and World War I map maker. So thank you very much for that, um, for that Mike. So Ian is asking, were the units involved equipped with Shermans and Sherman Fireflies or other armor. You mentioned you mentioned the the, the the Sherman threes with the seventy fives. Were there any Fireflies involved in what you've talked about today? Yes, um, usually one per troop. You know, held in reserve. The other there's the the, the troop commander's tank, then a couple of other Sherman threes, and the Sherman uh, Firefly brought up in the rear usually, uh, so it doesn't get. Of course, it was a prime target with the long the long gun. The Germans saw it right away, needed to take it out right away, and you know. 
Everyone says, idiot this, idiot that, idiot. It was largely 7.5 centimeter, um, you know, the Pac-40 anti-tank guns or, or the, um, the, uh, the, the, on the Panzer IV and Panzer, Panther 7.5 centimeter. Of course, there were mounts of tigers driving around, but not, not too many. Um, so despite the, 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 the determination of Roscoe Harvey, Brigadier Roscoe Harvey, the 29th Br Armored Brigade. He's a tiger. He's an absolute, you know, there's no one more aggressive. But despite that, the, the technology drags him down. He knows what he wants to do, how he wants to do it. But he sees helplessly from his, you know, command, you know, armored car, of his tanks, his squadrons getting decimated. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you for that. Um, we had a question, and I can't find it now. Where's it gone? Um, History Explorer is saying, do you think prioritizing self-propelled artillery to cross the Orn early would have provided the suppressive artillery so badly needed instead of being stuck in the bottleneck? That's a really good question, that. Yes, you know, because um, in the lat latter part of the 18th, the British spearheads had outdriven Royal Artillery so that that umbrella, that massive strength, the crown jewel of the British Army, um, it's, it's suddenly taken away from them. And Roscoe Harvey and others are forced to fight without this artillery help, uh, a, a, a massive tank battle. Now, they, they had, you know, um, this is an entirely different kettle of fish. They had, you know, huge numbers of fighter bombers circling, orbiting the skies above them. But the, 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 the ability of the RAF on the ground and the British Army liaison units on the ground to communicate with those pilots it's um, it's something for another show, but it's uh, it's very convoluted, and they can't bring down instantaneous air support. And I also want to say these maps dri dr uh, written or not written, but created by Mike Bechtold, they're absolutely spectacular. I believe he is, without a doubt, the the best map maker. And if uh, if you could employ him, if you're an author watching or thinking about you know needing a military map for any way, shape, or form. Uh, he is the man to communicate with. I'm sure you could find him easily on the internet. And he just says the proofs have arrived in your inbox. While you've been talking to me, they've arrived there. That's so right. A bit of a, I think David has done this deliberately to kind of just, you know, throw this idea at you. And it may be a bit of a rabbit hole. But David O'Keefe is asking, what are your thoughts on Simmons overall at this period? And I will add to that. Did your feelings about Simmons were they different before you started this project to where you are now? Because focusing on it from the German side of things, because as you said, there are limited German archives, but you know, it's always a good way is to judge a commander by what the enemy thought of them and how the Germans are reacting to what Simmons is doing. So uh, uh, however you want to address that question, and you can say some of it for the next show if you want, but kind of summarize how you feel on Simmons' uh, overall leadership. I believe that Simmons' leadership in the initial days in late July – in Operation Atlantic and Operation Spring, his operational plans and how he thinks the enemy will react are very much influenced by Italy and his, in, his, in his combat experiences there. The infantry first, tanks supporting from the rear, no major armored battles, uh, forests, big hills, mountains, obstacles, marshes everywhere in Italy. And, you know, we can't, and now it's entirely different. It's a different terrain and... The, they can't be ignored as a factor. The Waffen SS do fight differently. They, they are very, very aggressive. Um, and the, the tanks operate independently, often at night. You know, and, and Simmons is not ready for this. So it's a learning process, but it's a learning process in which the Canadian Infantry Corps terribly pays the price. Now, this, this may be you know going out on a limb too far, but often... The, the, the losses taken by the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division precipitate the Canadian Infantry other ranks re replacement reinforcement shortage later on in August when we need to at times be our strongest. The infantry companies and the infantry battalions due to this learning process for Simmons, he very, very much carries out an all-armoured super assault of Operation Totalize. But then you could say, arguably, he has learned from his experiences and thus his thinking has evolved. Um, but he, he and others, Brigadier Young of the 6th Canadian Infantry Brigade most and Brigadier Megill of the 5th Canadian Infantry Brigade, which we'll discuss at length, 
they they sit not sit and watch idly by you know in a criminal matter but they witness the destruction absolute destruction and carnage of the best and brightest of of, of a canadian generation this is forced as an infantryman carrying a 303 or a bren gun to combat a panzer IV or a panther driving right over you and you know the the anti-tank guns aren't there yet and so this this comprehension that simmons you know, an artilleryman, a very intelligent, very innovative, but still having this Italy mentality that doesn't exactly transfer into the battlefields of Normandy and this excellent tank country, some parts of it anyway, on Verrier's Ridge and on Brojebus Ridge, which the Waffen SS, fresh from Russia, people often give the Waffen SS the, the stick, you know, the 12th SS, you know, they thought they were in the Ukraine and we slaughtered them in great numbers. That's very much true. But it goes both ways. It's a double-edged sword. Simmons thought he was potentially still in Italy. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, but it's for the second show, and we won't go, on a, go down a rabbit hole here, but this continues, this Atlantic-style debacles at times, even though there are victories. The, 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 the carnage continues into spring and into late July and early August around Tilly La Campagne. As all the German or Canadian divisions, the Second Canadian Infantry Division, as well as the Third Canadian Infantry Division and the Fourth Canadian Armored Division, launch these piecemeal assaults that the Germans just chew up. So, sorry if I went on a little bit longer. Oh, that's fine. Well, well, Alex, uh, Alex Black agrees with <laughs> like your sorry that was, that was he he liked your description on response to Simmons' question. Uh, David O'Keefe agrees wholeheartedly. Uh, Shell Drake makes the point, of course, that excellent tank country is also excellent anti-tank country, which is like the uh, um, tracer fire goes both ways. We'll do one more little quick question, and I think we'll bring things in. So Alex is asking, did Simmons have the opportunity to re review reports or visit the early Normandy front? It's a good point because he does come into things when the campaign is well underway. So he, you know, he wasn't part of those early pushes, you know, the first few days towards Corps. So had he been able to catch up and read up on what had been happening in the, in the earlier phases of June and mid-June? Yes, he did, you know, almost as a tourist, not a tourist, but, you know, uh, in various headquarters watching this, watching that, watching this operation, seeing what's going on on Hill 112, seeing what's going on on Charmant. Of course, he's waiting, he's championed at the bit for the 2nd Canadian Corps to be activated, to become active, and for the 2nd Canadian Infantry Division to arrive so that he gets what he wants, which is battlefield operational command and to take part in in the breakout for the, the, the of the normandy bridgehead now there are some tank battles that he observes tremendous losses of british tanks and canadian tanks and so this almost this mentality of infantry first just like in italy mm. we'll, we'll just continue doing that and whatever shortages or you know um, strengths need to be made up. Well, the, the Royal Canadian Artillery will carry the load and we'll just blast the living daylights out of them. And the minute the, the, the tanks show up, the German tanks will have the anti-tank guns, the six pounders and 17 pounders will be set. We'll just see them off. But there's always the appreciation in Simmons' mind, sort of the assumption that the infantry will always reach the objective and be able to consolidate and be ready for the Germans. Now, if they catch them in a meeting engagement, the Canadian infantrymen, as they're racing towards their objective, terrible problems could occur. And they, they do, unfortunately. Well, there's, you're, you're giving very, really good, well-considered responses here. And I think generally, I mean, I've talked with Brad about um, Simmons. We've, talk, we've talked repeatedly about Montgomery and Dempsey and O'Connor came up in a the sidebar there. As I think, you know, when you, when you, Sometimes I think we have the benefit of nearly 80 years of hindsight. We can look back and we can spend lots of time looking at some of the decisions made and go, oh, well, perhaps that wasn't the right, the, the best thing. But what you've taken us through today over really three or four days of an, of an ever changing battlefield, it's it's constantly the, the bit that's the focus on the focus is shifting from Gronterville to, to Canny. You've taken us through that, the, 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 the very average you've taken from Trotville Farm across the points, et cetera. 
it's easy for us to kind of follow these movements on a map now with clarity. But at the time, it was much harder for these commanders to have a sense of what was happening where. And I think, you know, when we've done shows about the Falaise Gap, you do have to kind of remember, folks, that from this period in July, one month later, the Allies have bested two German armies in Normandy and surround them in the Falaise Gap. So criticism is 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 is, is correct, and it, we can be consider what these commanders have achieved and how they could have things done things better. But let's not forget, folks, that a, uh, the German army is resoundingly crushed over the next month in in Normandy, and and you know the the few Germans that we with escape at the Falaise Gap have been bested through all these operations. You know, all even going back to Epsom, they all played their part. Even the ones that were not even anywhere near fifty percent successful, they were attriting the Germans. The Germans, as we've said repeatedly, they can't replace their vehicles, they can't replace their manpower. And every time, yes, the Allies lose Sherman tanks in Goodwood and Very Ridge, and they lose personnel. They, they can, they can replace those. They can replace the armor better than they can replace the men. And I think that's worth to worth considering. But we, I think, we will think, bring things in now. Those we're in danger of going down lots of armor uh, rabbit holes. We were asking about um, ammunition and and use of <laughs> anti tank. So we'll we'll do that for another time. So Arthur. It has been an absolute tour de force presentation. We will just decide at what point when you're going to come back on when the second book is out, and we will pick up for part two. Um, but but you part two has been submitted. You finished the writing. Is that correct? Yes, yes. It's now with uh, Mrs. Ruth Shepherd of Casemate and the copy editors savaging it. I'm sure the the bomb is going to drop on me here in a little bit, uh, where I'll have to use the uh, the month of August to to busily um, the the uh, correct things. The, um, the new book is very much to talk about some of the themes you just uh, spoke of there. By drawing the cream of the German army to south of Caen to fight these tremendous battles, the British Second Army drew the, the best panzer divisions onto it. And of course, they couldn't be two places at once. Yeah. And due to this, due to this almost um, uh, sacrifice of, of some of the best British and Canadian men of a generation, the American First Army breaks out in Operation Cobra, which is exactly. takes a, a huge part of the the new book as well. Chapter yeah. is devoted to Cobra. I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because tying in co that we've talked about it repeatedly. The the telling of history nationalistically is that the British and Canadians write about Goodwood, but don't and, and and spring, but then don't necessarily bring in Cobra. And Americans write about Cobra, but don't necessarily bring in Blue Coat that followed. And I think you've got to look at all these things side by side. And you know. And, and when you look at the, the massive advances made by Cobra, and on Friday, folks, Kevin Hemel is talking about the, the American 8th Corps smashing down the western side of the Cotentin towards Avranche. Well, one of the reasons they're able to do that is there's very little German armor ahead of them there because the German armor is all up around Caen. And that's, as you said there very succinctly, Garth, the Germans can't haven't got enough tanks to put in both places. And the Allies are slowly but steadily building up this massive amount of artillery and armor and engineers behind this. So when the breakout finally occurs, there's this massive, great, as James Holland would say, big war to thrust out behind it. So, well, we are, we, we'll bring things in. So just just a, one last question, just a little quick, what, what are you going to work on next? There, as you submitted the second one there, what's what's next? Italian campaign, Furton Falaise Gap, what's, what's next on the horizon for you? I have received a bunch of research money to write a book, which will be expansion of my MA thesis. Um, it will be called The Defeat and Attrition of the 12th SS Panzer Division and deal with the battles from the 7th of June right until the fall of Khan and the withdrawal of the SS 12th SS Panzer Division from the battlefield. Um, this Many people may not know this, but... To quote the Jerry Maguire, you had me at the defeat of the 12th SS. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, the, yeah, that, the title alone, you, you sold me on it, yeah. The, to let a cat out of the bag, you know, the German, the French military historians know this and use this in their books. The, the war diaries of the SS Panzer Grenadier Regiments of the 12th SS Panzer Division and the Panzer Regiment have survived. And this, but the French have used them, but I don't think an Anglo, um, the, apart from Norbert Samzaver, he they haven't used them to uh, to a great degree yet to to give a larger larger overview of these battles these these bridgehead battles in which the the 12th ss panzer division seeks to impose the initiative but loses it yeah. and so yes i believe the people would really really go for a book like that but i gotta finish off this volume two first but yeah, that no, one's it's waiting well, for I, me I, 
you've just you've just whetted my appetite for not only vo volume two, but now this new book about the defeat of the twelfth day. As I said, you had me at the title there because it's been a big thing on Twitter. I think three books came out in the 12th SS last yes. year, and they were all very much the, much the kind of the, oh, look at how amazing these guys are, crushing Canadian advances and British and doing that. And it's like, I'm just fed up with that. I'm not going to get into that rabbit hole down now, but I'm, I want I, the defeat of the 12th SS. It's, it's just, you, you, I'll buy it based on that title alone. So, <laughs> folks, we'll bring, we'll bring through things to end. So I'm going to take you off screen for a second. So, folks, tomorrow, uh, oh, that's just me, wrong me. Tomorrow, folks, Dilip Sarkar is coming back on. Just a kind of short show, probably 30 minutes tomorrow night. To talk about his amazing Battle of the Britain project that he started. If you don't know anything about it, have a check of the promo video I did. So Dilip Sarkar, who is a prolific author of books about the Royal Air Force and a couple of books about, about uh, Arnhem and other things, is coming on to talk about this incredible project to collate more information, more uh, material, particularly those members of the British public or public around the world who had a relative who was involved in the Battle of Britain, but perhaps in a ground crew role or in the, in the WAFs or a Royal Observer course. So Dilip's going to come on and talk about how you... You people watching this can help this amazing Battle of Britain, Britain project. So that's tomorrow night's show, usual time, 7 p.m. UK time. So I'm going to bring Arthur back in to say goodbye. So um, absolutely fantastic, Arthur. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. So we're going to bring things to an end. So um, this is Paul Woodard from World War II TV. It's thanking everybody for being with us tonight. tonight and thank you for the, uh, the, the, the views. And thank you for going out and buying Arthur's book, as I'm sure you will. So cheers, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye-bye.